In the chronicler's cell at Montbreth Abbey in France, writing monks record the events of their time. Brother Boniface is the guardian of chronicles which date back to the fall of the Roman Empire and record the chaos that followed. Force ruled everywhere. People began to look to the strong for protection and submitted themselves as serfs to those who had the means and skills for fighting. The early chronicles reveal knights as cruel, ignorant, fighting men. Their only occupation was war. As life in feudal Europe became better organized, a code of honor developed based upon ideals of chivalry, religion, and the knight's status as professional warriors. While this code was not often adhered to, it was an ideal to which they all aspired. Among the writings of Brother Boniface, there is the tale of a youth, Robert de Goncourt, who was raised according to the code of chivalry of his time, and whose story we will hear as the chronicler himself might have told it. Our tale begins in the year of our Lord, 1192, when the noble Lord of Goncourt sent his son Robert to the mighty Lord of Montbreff to learn chivalry and the skills of knighthood at Montbreff Castle. In the year 1192, the castle of Montbreff stood proud and mighty, guarded by impregnable towers and surrounded by a deep moat. Here, Robert de Goncourt began his apprenticeship as a page, the first step toward knighthood. At the age of seven, under the experienced hand of Lady Alice de Montbreff. My lady? Welcome, Robert. Enter in and draw nearer, my lad. Truly, I am glad of your coming. When you enter into your lord's hall, cry you, Godspeed, and with humble cheer, greet those who there be present. Do not rush rudely in, but enter gently with head up and at an easy pace. Bow, even as I do now. So, like this. Do you understand? Now go you and attempt it. Good. Again. It is fairly done. You are a true Goncourt. And so learning commenced. Robert de Goncourt encountered another youthful page at Montbreff, Gerald de Banks, together with whom he was to be raised under the watchful glance of Lady Alice until both lads attained 14 years and were ready to be squires to Sir Giles. While their apprenticeship as pages endured, Robert and Gerald were learning to conduct themselves as noblemen. They knew that each true, valiant knight should be able to dance gracefully and serenade his own chosen lady with sweet love ballads. In Montbreff Castle, learning was also held in high regard. Each day, the worthy castle chaplain undertook to teach the young pages the art of reading, and from him, they learned to speak in Latin, the tongue of the church and all learned men. Besides the two pages, there were younger children in the castle. They had many pastimes, such as walking on stilts behind the castle walls or playing ball under the supervision of some member of the household. They sported at marbles and spent the day in carefree leisure. But the pages stand close by their lady, often listening to stories about knightly deeds of their ancestors. Anon there were brought two great spears and every knight got a spear, and therewith they ran together that Montbreve's all too shivered. But the other knight hit him so hard in midst of the shield that horse and man fell to the earth. From such tales of the deeds of great heroes, the boys learned about knightly valor. They also played at knightly games. Most favored of these was the game of tournaments with toy knights on horseback, played in strict accord with the laws of tournaments.
most of the early education of the two pages rested in the hands of the ladies of Montbeth. But the master himself also contributed his part in their raising. In moments of respite, when Sir Giles sat down to play at one of the manly games such as backgammon or chess, the young pages were permitted to stand by and witness the game. But these were all light pastimes. The page's real fortune was that of a warrior and horseman. So, often as he watched the stablemen and old esquires, Robert would imagine himself a great knight, mounted on his steed. Part of Robert's apprenticeship was passed around horses. Elder squires, such as this man, who doubtless lacked the gold to purchase the costly gear of knighthood, often served as instructors of young noblemen. Have no dread of horses, Robert. Sit you fast in the saddle. Allow the beast closer acquaintance of you. Only then will he be your honest steed, faithful in battle and tournament. And so Robert's days were full, measured out equally in periods of grave study and in manly practice for his future calling. Seven years sped by. Robert's time as a page drew to an end. On St. Andrew's Day, which was his 14th birthday, Page Robert de Goncourt became Squire Robert, servant to his lordship. Peace, I cry. You sport like Mary Page is newly come. Remember, you are squires now. Thus commenced the second period of apprenticeship for Robert de Goncourt and for Gerald de Banks. As squires, their service was to their lord directly. From henceforward, their apprenticeship was not in toys and trifles, but in service and in arms. They waited on the lord at mealtime, carving his meat and tending his needs. Come, Robert. Make full my cup. Enough. was the glorious moment for Robert and Gerald to face their own lord in a manly game. Serving the master meant partaking of his leisure and his duties. The squire's tasks were many, maintaining the brilliance of the lord's shining armor and the sharpness of his weapons keeping the hunting equipment ever ready for the master's call, dressing him for battle or the hunt, and following behind wherever he might go.
But whenever there was free time, the squires were to be seen practicing their favorite game, tilting at the quintain. Unless he be proficient at this, no man could ever hope to make a good warrior. The quintain is an effigy of a knight with shield in one hand, club or sandbag in the other. The squire doth charge it. If he strike poorly, giving an imperfect blow of his lance, the spinning quintain will buffet him as he passes. to harden their muscles, young squires were trained to mount horses with heavy weights affixed to their belts. Someday, they would needs ride in heavy woven mail, laden with burdensome weapons, and at the knighting ceremony, will have to leap on their steeds without touching the stirrup. At softer moments, Robert and Gerald learned to sing love ballads and popular songs. As they learned, the court watched. And whenever the master had occasion in their presence, he explained to them the rights and duties of a nobleman in the society to which they belonged. As they grew, they learned to handle weapons worthy of their might and skill. Montbref Hall provided excellent teachers for the young noblemen. In labor and sport, Robert's years of apprenticeship followed fast upon each other till his life at Montbref Hall reached its close. He was 21 years old. So, on Ascension Day in the year 1205, 14 years after he had arrived, Squire Robert de Goncourt fulfilled the conditions for elevation to knighthood. In the early morning of the day before his dubbing, Robert's knightly armor was displayed in the Hall of Arms for the wonder and admiration of the court. A knight's weapons and costumes cost much gold. Robert's uncle, Sir Remy de Tournival, volunteered to be his sponsor, furnishing his armor and his steed. A golden-handled sword, hammered by a swordsmith of renown. A visor, fashioned by the armorer of Tournival. And golden spurs, the gift most precious of all. But except for this short respite, Robert's day was devoted to a strictly prescribed ceremony. For the young Robert, this was a solemn time indeed. Already he had taken his bath to purge him of past sins and don the white shirt which betokens purity. A young squire was aiding him to put on the tunic of scarlet which signified his readiness to shed blood in the service of God. For Robert, this was a day of purifying fast, which readied him for the ceremony of greatest import, the Vigil of Arms. Pater Noster quis sinceli sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat rinum tuum, via voluntas tua sicut in cielo et in terra. Aid me, O God, to perform my duties with valor as becomes a knight. Bequeath to me honor and to my lord long life. But I must From dawn on Ascension Day, the castle was astir with life. In the halls, there was much preparation for the feast which was to follow the dubbing ceremony. The courtyard jumped with minstrels and clowns, with jugglers and artists, all gathered for the glorious occasion.
Purified in body and soul, Robert marched in solemnly, prepared for the most... Sir Remy, Lord of Tunival, knight of great merit himself as sponsor, bears the privilege of fastening Robert's spurs of gold. Sir Giles, Lord of Montbreff, Robert's teacher and master, performs the dubbing. Be valiant, Sir Robert. Recall your heritage. Honor all knights. Love God. I pledge my life and my allegiance to God, my Lord, and to my master. Then came the moment when Sir Robert was expected to make the running leap to his mount's back without touching the stirrups. A moment of awe for his family and comrades. Hail to Sir Robert the young knight. Hail to the noble newly born to his rank, who has joined the fellowship of defenders of the faith. Protector of the poor, servant to fair ladies. A very perfect gentle knight, bold and intrepid, guardian of his rights. Eager to bear his banner aloft above all nobles else. Thus, Sir Robert takes his place beside Sir Giles and Sir Philip. But not all noblemen are thusly honored. The friend of his apprenticeship, Gerald de Banks, still remained a squire, serving his master, maybe hiring himself out to other barons, and awaiting his chance to earn knighthood. And here, indeed, is where my story ends. For Sir Robert de Goncourt soon left the place of his apprenticeship the castle of Montbreff, and set out upon the journey to his new manor, which he received from his uncle as a fief, which he named New Goncourt. The story of Sir Robert is that of many knights of his time noblemen whose chief occupation was war. As time went on, knightly armor changed from woven mail to breastplates to full metal battle dress. And for as long as battles were fought according to the rules of chivalry, this warrior class maintained its prominent position in the society of the Middle Ages. When the day came that every man with a gun could fight, specialists were no longer needed and the feudal lords retired into their manor houses to devote themselves to governing their tenants. With the evolution of strong central power, Sir Robert's heirs had fulfilled their function as protectors of feudal society. A new age dawned over the Western world.